Open up a meter box in a brand new home and you'll often see this. Cables with the outer sheath stripped right back, leaving just a single layer of insulation between you and a live supply. But here's a question for you. If you saw this on an EICR, how would you code it? Would you raise it as a concern at all? Let us know in the comments. We're genuinely interested in how different electricians view this one. And later in the video, we will be reviewing the electrical industry's guidance. Most of the time in this type of enclosure, we are used to seeing the meter tails with two layers layers of PVC like the ones from Doncaster Cables. This version has 19 strands, making them very flexible and easier to route in tight spaces. However, electricians may call this double insulated. I know I certainly have. So what is basic protection? Basic protection is about preventing electric shock under normal conditions. So this isn't about fault conditions or failure. It's about your first line of defense when the system is operating normally. So how can we offer basic protection? We can provide basic protection by using barriers or enclosures, basically something solid that stops you getting anywhere near live part. To actually count as basic protection, those barriers have to do two things. Regulation 416.2.1 says barriers or enclosures shall provide a degree of protection not less than IP2X. Now that sounds technical, but what that actually means is nothing bigger than 12.5 millimeters wide and longer than 80 millimeters should be able to get in and touch anything live either. But then we have regulation 416.2.4, which adds another layer. Access to live parts providing basic protection shall not be possible without the use of a tool. So if you need a screwdriver or key to open that enclosure, then it still counts as protected. That's why consumer units are compliant. Now, let's look at two lesser used ways of protecting people from electric shock, obstacles and placing out of reach. Obstacles are designed to stop someone from accidentally coming into contact with live parts. They don't need to be locked or IP rated, but they must physically get in the way of access. According to regulation 417.2.1, an obstacle must do two things, prevent unintentional bodily approach to live parts and prevent unintentional contact during normal operation of equipment. That might include things like mesh screens, railings or fixed panels in front of open terminals or switch gear. Now here's the important detail. The reg says an obstacle can be removable and it doesn't need a key or tool, but it must be secured in a way that prevents accidental removal. So if someone could just kick it over, lift it out of place or knock it loose, it wouldn't comply. So obstacles are only meant to stop accidental contact. They won't protect against someone who's determined to get past them. That's why this method is usually found in controlled areas where only trained or authorized people People have access. So next is placing out of reach. This method is all about distance, keeping bare live parts far enough away that nobody can reach them by accident. Regulation 417.3 makes it clear this method is only suitable for preventing unintentional contact. Let's have a look. If you're dealing with overhead lines, say between buildings, they need to follow a separate set of rules under the electricity safety, quality and continuity regulations. But if we're talking about bare live parts indoors, then the rule is is simple. 417.3.1 says they must not be within arm's reach, which the regs define as 2.5 meters from any of the following, an exposed conductive part, an extraneous conductive part, or another bare live part from a different circuit. Why? Because touching two parts at different voltages at once could result in a serious electric shock. The regs call this simultaneously accessible, meaning two parts close enough that someone could touch both at the same time. If they're less than 2.5 meters apart, they're considered accessible together. Regulation 417.3.2 goes even further. If the person is behind a barrier like a handrail or screen that doesn't meet IPXXB or IP2X, then the 2.5 meters is measured from the barrier, not the person. The same applies vertically. Arms reach upwards is 2.5 five meters from the standing surface, regardless of what's in between, unless it's properly rated. And just like with obstacles, this only applies to direct contact by someone standing and reaching with bare hands. No ladders, no tools, just normal movement. So both of these methods, obstacles and placing out of reach, can protect against shock, but they're only effective in the right environment and only for the kind of risks they're designed to prevent. Let's address the most common form of basic protection, insulation of live parts, or should we be really calling it basic basic protection of live parts. Insulation of live parts is by far the most common way we protect against electric shock. Regulation 416.1 puts it like this. 
Live parts shall be completely covered with insulation, which can only be removed by destruction. For equipment, the insulation shall comply with the relevant standard for such electrical equipment. To count as basic protection, the insulation must completely cover the live part, so there's no bare conductor showing. Be tough enough that you can't peel it off by hand, you'd have to cut it, melt it, or otherwise destroy it. And it has to be tested to proper British standards, like BSEN 50525, that covers the general requirements for low voltage electrical cables with rated voltages up to and including 450 to 750 volts. It applies to the types of cables most electricians work with every day, like this Earthshore cable. Let's break it down. The outer insulation is there to provide mechanical protection. The inner insulation is our basic protection, there to prevent direct access to live parts. And this layer of insulation around the CPC is not insulation, but rather there to identify it as a protective conductor. But if we take Take a look at one of Doncaster Cable's more advanced cables, the PV Ultra. You'll see it's built with even more layers. At the centre, you've got the copper conductor, that's the live part. Wrapped tightly around that is your basic insulation. This is the layer that stops you from getting a shock under normal conditions. A second insulation layer for extra electrical strength and ensure the cable is double insulated. A layer of bedding material which helps keep the cable's shape and flexibility. And people often thought this was a layer of insulation but it is not. And finally, a tough outer sheath which protects it from things like water, sunlight or physical damage during installation. So, armed with what we have learned, let's look at that meter box from the beginning of the video with the single insulation visible inside in the meter box. If we look in Nappit's code breaker, we can see this is a C2, action required. But before you click off, that's not the case. Let's see what Electrical Safety First and the Wiring Regulations Advisory Group said. They state that a meter cupboard which can only be opened with a key or tool qualifies as an enclosure, as per the definition in BS 7671, which states, a part providing protection of equipment against certain external influences and, in any direction, protection against direct contact. In simpler terms, an enclosure is something that protects the equipment inside from things like dust, water and mechanical damage, and at the same time prevents people from accidentally touching live parts. The key takeaway is that an enclosure isn't just a box, it must also limit access to live parts, either by its construction or by requiring a tool or key to open it, which ties into regulation 416.2.4. But there are conditions. The cupboard door's locking mechanism is working properly. The hinges are secure and intact, and there's no visible damage to the insulation on show. If those boxes are ticked, then the cupboard meets the standard. If you want to find out if SY cable can be used in final circuits, check out this video. Big thanks to Hank in Morpeth for that question. There's a £20 Amazon voucher on its way to you. And if you've got a burning electrical question that you want an answer to, then send it in to willittripp at efix.co.uk.